because it'll be, well, pretty much a repetition of what you have already seen. But anyways. So, um, yeah, and the basic idea will be that we'll be, put bound, so we'll be putting bounds in the low energy couplings of ion effective field theory, and we'll do this uh, at large end. So we'll write dispersion relations, and by basic assumptions like crossing symmetry and unitarity, we'll put bounds in these uh, low energy uh, EFT couplings. And of course, the, the motivation for studying this is the long-standing dream of, of solving um, QCD in this large end limit. So the logic is, is, that it is that if you can locate um, the, the EFT for large MQC, that can help you in eventually solving it. Okay? But of course, uh, we don't expect to land right in just on a large MQC. What we do is we explore the whole, the whole space of healthy um, large M um, confining gauge theories. And then you would like to, to find where QCD lies inside this, this plot. So we might be hopeful and, and secretly hope that um, so perhaps we're, we're lack, as lucky as the uh, people of the, of the conformal bootstrap, where many interesting, physically interesting theories like the Easy model happen to lie at some special points of these exclusion plots. So for one of the motivations is perhaps one can hope the large MQCD will sit at some special point of this, of this exclusion plot. Okay. And this, I want to emphasize this assumption of large M because it, it, it's going to be crucial. And first, what it does for you is that it simplifies a lot of QCD itself. And by as well, the usual planar limit, and that's where it behaves like a string theory, and that's where you might hope to, to eventually solve it, right? But also in, in this context of, of um, dispersion relations, uh, the large M assumption is, is very useful and makes this problem very um, well suited for, for the weak coupling methods that we will use. So basically, it's, uh, it makes the theory very weakly coupled, and then it's very um, it's perfectly suitable for, for these methods. So let me be a little more precise by, by what, what I mean um, by QCD. And of course, what I mean is SUN, so N is the number of colors, uh, Yang-Mills theory with um, NF uh, quarks in the fundamental representation, so quarks, that uh, we will take to be massless. So we'll take mass of the quarks to be zero, and that this is the so-called um, chiral limit. Okay, and for the purpose of today's talk, just for simplicity, I'll take this number to be 2, so up and down quarks. And this is just a simplification. It, uh, actual, actually, the dependence on NF completely drops, drops out. And you can also think of space-time dimensions equals to 4 um, for the finiteness, but also uh, this is easy, easy to generalize to, to other dimensions. Okay, so this theory, um, of course, uh, involves quarks and gluons, but uh, it's, it's a confining theory, and we assume it, uh, we, as usual, assume it remains confining for any, any number of colors, and therefore it is really a theory of, of um, color singlet states, and as such is a theory of mesons, of glue balls, and variants. So today we'll um, do the simplest thing you can do, and uh, we'll, we'll stick to the meson subsector. What we'll do is to consider scattering of, of uh, mesons, in particular of the low, lowest lying ones. So we'll study to do scattering of pions. So pions are um, the lowest mesons in the spectrum, and in this chiral limit, they are massless, and they can be understood as Goldston bosons for chiral symmetry breaking. So the pion is the Goldston boson for the SU2 symmetry, so SU2 left, because SU2 right, going to the isospin. As it should, uh, okay. The Gilson bosons for this are these pions where this label here is the flavor index. It's uh, plus, minus, or zero, effectively. Okay. And we'll study this, uh, this scattering, so 2 to 2 scattering of pions in the usual large and knit limit, so 2 limit where we send n going to infinity with the tooth coupling lambda. It's g yang mills squared times n. Okay. And of course, there are, um, in this uh, limit, the, the diagrams that contribute to this scattering of pions 
uh, arranged in a topological expansion, and we'll stick to living order at large, and, and we'll see uh, how that simplifies a lot the, the theory. Yeah. So, uh, um, by, by fixing lambda, you mean fixing lambda QCD? Uh, um, yes. Um, well, it's the, uh, the usual two of yes. But there's an RG running. I mean, Sorry? There's RG running. You, you, you mean fixing you, the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's fixing as in, like, but when, when I said I'm doing. So, it's just for the, camp, uh, the, the running. Sorry. It's just for the for the large end counting rules. Yeah, of course this is going to be running. I'm not going to. So we'll, it will be for any 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 lambda. I'm just saying that when you send n to infinity and you're going to do the counting and the diagrams, you should think of uh, GN Mills as being one over square root n. Yeah, uh, that's all I mean by by fixed here. Yes. Thank you. So um, the sort of diagrams that we will have will be a pi and going in and using double line notations because they are q q bar pairs. The two pi ends going in, two pi ends going out. So here's a quark going in, a quark going up, C, pi d, and then um, a living order in large n, the only diagrams that contribute have the topology of a disk. So here we have um, an external quark loop that flavors order them, orders them, and then here in this shaded area, we have uh, all the um, planar contractions of gluons that, that we can have. Then this contributes uh, as one over n, if you use large n uh, counting. So this is a standard uh, to, uh, to play, and we'll stick to this living order. But just for um, effectiveness, let me write a couple more diagrams that will be subliving uh, in one over n. So uh, it's subliving order, we have extra quark loops. So here we have like, some gluon, and then an extra quark loop, and as many gluons as you want. And this is further suppressed by one over n, so this is one over n squared. And then we can have non-planar diagrams that look like This, where they um, have some, basically like a glow string coming out from the plane. And these, these handles are further suppressed by powers of one run, and so on and so forth. Okay. So you have the usual topological expansion, and it's clear from these uh, sort of pictures that this really looks like the scattering of open strings. And what we're doing by sticking to leading order at large n is studying the tree level QCD string. Okay. But, so that's, are we supposed to believe this? Uh, no, no, no. This, so this is just uh, this is an analogy. Oh, we're not going to assume that. Uh, oh, the counting you mean, or the? Yeah, I mean, this was work, works were like done in the eighties, you know, by famous people. But is there any evidence that it's actually true? So the, the, it arranges in this way. I, th I think it's. Uh, I mean, these are some theoretical arguments done in the eighties. But is there? In the time which passed, do, is there any evidence, hard evidence, that this is actually true? What, what do you mean? What, what's what, yeah. what, what's the controversial about that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could say these are just some nice pictures about some nice diagrams. As she, she just mentioned, there is some running. Strictly speaking, at lambda QCG, you know, the coupling blows up. At, at the QCD scale, so this is a running coupling, and, we uh, here, we are, and here we are pretending that the coupling is fixed, because we're like a formal theory. We're not pretending any of that. I mean, th there's indeed a lambda QCD, which is fixed in terms of the renormalization scale, and, and it, it is exponential to minus one over lambda. No, no, but let me, so, so the fine scattering is going to be dominated by, by the hadronic scale. At the hadronic scale, perturbative expansion breaks down anyway. So the, the coupling blows up. The okay, we're assuming, we're assuming, we're assuming the larger end expansion uh, is valid in QCD as your. Ah, so it's an assumption. It's an extremely conservative assumption. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I was asking, is there any evidence for that? Is, is there any new evidence which emerged for this since Witten's paper? Uh, Let this result. Okay, so results this from, from uh, Pepper, for example, show a very beautiful convergence of the spectrum for large n. Physical <laughs> observers depend very mildly on n as you take n large. You take already n equal 5 or 6 is basically n equal infinity. We have known that the phenomenology of large n QCD captures many qualitative features of the real world since the 70s. And yeah, it's so no, oh, come on. In the 70s, nobody could do anything. <laughs> I think Tepper did pure no. blue theory. Did Tepper do uh, large with, with, with fermions? Many other people have done <laughs> But 
anyway, by the standards of physics, I would say that it's very solid that there is a one over n expansion. It would be nice to. I mean, and then, of course, what the other thing is we have toy models, like Andrew Fox, Korea Mills, but that is so much. Right. Uh, so, so uh, just kind of a, a basic thing. Uh, if, if you scan over energy up to, uh, you know, a scale like you see, uh, if you only look at the leading 1 over n order amplitude, you're going to hit a resonance hole, right? Uh, and that, the, the, just a, the correction that moves the resonance off the real, uh, let's say, s axis uh, is going to require summing up, uh, in some sense, non-planar diagram. Uh, no, I mean, we're going to have resonances that correspond to the different mesons in, in the spectrum. So like, we're, we're going to hit like, all the different mesons in the spectrum, and the resonances, if we stick to large and counting, will only be mesons. Uh, we, we will, so this would be like meson loops, and, and this would be further suppressed by, by part of one of right. But I'm just saying that if you don't take account of the decay width of the resonances, if I let you entirely found. <coughs> I, I mean... You, yeah, you, but it's only going to care about the residues. Maybe I'm misstating a bit what's going to come, but it's only going to use the risk too small. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, okay, uh, fine. Uh, but, but, but I mean, but, but technically, uh, as an expansion, the, the, that is resumming mm. subsets of all the 1 over n corrections, right? Yeah, this expansion is valid as long as you don't look too close for the pole. Right, so um, these are the sort of diagrams that. Uh, we will uh, we will take and so the the one of the main simplifications that comes from this is that it's very easy to deal with uh, with the flavor dependence because since uh, they are only um, so they are only uh, diagrams with the topology of the bits with this quark loop um, we will only have a single traces in the in these indices here so basically uh, this diagram is going to be equal to a trace of uh, the one Pauli matrix for each of these pines. Pines are as a spin triplet, so I can associate a, a Pauli matrix for each of them, and we'll have sigma A, sigma B, sigma D, sigma C, times a simpler amplitude, and that's a new, that basically corresponds to this, the scattering of identical. <coughs> okay? So this is a simpler amplitude, this amplitude, that in the language of string theory could be something like the Venetiana amplitude, and, and that's what we will study. Okay? And these are the, what in string theory are known as champ atom factors. Right? So the full amplitude is something that I'm a uh, large n, of course, that I'm going to call um, script T, and they be CD, will be given by different contractions of this thing. So I have first this trace, so exactly this diagram, and there's a new, and then I have different orderings of the legs. The trace I flip um, D and C, and I have this with the same amplitude, it's going to, it's going to be the same object but a different uh, channel for this, so ST, and then another term, it's trace, change B and C, M of T and U. So this is the full amplitude of, of this uh, A, B, C, and D pines. Um, but we will uh, translate all the properties of this to uh, properties of this more si simpler amplitude, and this is the one that we that we will study. Okay. Now, one of the main properties of this is that it's crossing symmetric, and um, so crossing, and that's basically because now we're scattering identical objects once you've dealt with the with the flavor uh, dependence. So it satisfies m has a u equals m of u and s. <coughs> However, uh, it is not fully crossing symmetric, so not T with S and U, and this is because of the, of the quark loop. So this quark loop um, orders the different legs, and now we can have the S channel where these two, fall, uh, these two legs basically come together, or the U channel where these two legs come together, but this one going to that one corresponds to a different, a different trait, so different ordering for the legs. Okay, so we only have this uh, S U crossing symmetry, and no, and no full crossing symmetry. Okay, so that's one thing. Now let's talk about the analytic structure of, of this object. Okay, and the, the claim is that at large n, this is a meromorphic function whose poles correspond just to the, the physical mesons in the spectrum. Okay, and a way to see this uh, pictorially is that you can uh, redraw this, this sort of uh, diagram. So this diagram still looks something this more suggestive way. 
where you see now that in the intermediate, um, in the intermediate um, state, you're only exchanging a QQ bar pair. So if you were to have diagrams like this, you would have nice little loops, but here at large n, you only have um, um, the poles corresponding to the net and exchange. Okay, so this amplitude uh, will can be rewritten in terms of, of the different mesons. We would have uh, diagrams like this. So here you have your ions going in. They exchange a rho meson at the speed of one uh, massive particle, and then uh, all the other mesons in the spectrum. So the next one is something called the F2 meson, and so on and so forth. Um, so and, and the point is that these these couplings here are proportional to one over square root n. It's a usual um, story that, that <coughs> unshell three point couplings are proportional to one over square root n. So, in the large n limit, this is very weakly coupled, and that's why uh, we only have true level exchanges. So, usually um, people um, complain about loops and logs and so on, but here they are further suppressed by one over n. They are finding then corrections to, to this story. Okay. So, the analytic structure of, of this uh, amplitude is very simple it just has a bunch of poles. On the S axis. Oh, let me draw the usual plot. We have a complex S plane for U zero. And I have a bunch of poles here corresponding to the mass of the Romans in the first exchange state and the next pole and all the methods in the spectrum. Okay. And finding, well, in a sense, solving large MPCD corresponds to finding the locations of these poles with their residues. So the masses of spins and unshell couplings of these, of these methods. Okay. And notice that I'm not drawing any poles here on the, on the negative s-axis. And this is, again, also um, a consequence from, uh, from large n. Okay. This is something that um, comes from, in the final language, something called a Zweig's rule. So, Rule, but it's an easy counting. That's the. Uh, can I? Yes. Can I ask this question? So, okay, so mm -hmm. you. you uh, I was just wondering if there are some matches <laughs> simulation which would show that as you increase n, but if you keep the number of flavors, then uh, the resonances, because people can measure the masses of resonances in the market, but the mass of zero or omega, is there some evidence? But if you take the n equal 10, then uh, the masses of these resonances they tend to certain constants, and the width becomes smaller and smaller. And then you predict that the width is going to become smaller as 1 over n. So are you aware of such logic simulations that show this? Um, I, I'm aware about the simulations that do show the, the, the spectrum and that it, it does uh, appear to converge. Um, about the widths, I'm not so sure that uh, they, they are discussed in that line. But uh, about, about the resonances, uh, yes, yeah, so the spectrum has been measured and it converges. Okay. Yes. Thank you for the question. So, right, here is a very simple argument. That's that uh, if, you have, if, you're, okay, if you have um, two pions going to two pions, intermediate state, um, can carry the three isospin channels. So um, there are isospin triplets, so the intermediate state can carry um, zero, one, or two isospin. However, in large n, we just, we just said that the intermediate state has to be uh, a physical uh, meson, and a meson is a QQ bar pair. So the isospin that it can have, of course, is just zero or one. Okay, so this and the isospin two channel cannot have physical poles at large n. And if you um, work this out, you see that the isospin two channel of this amplitude is proportional to m, this simple a simple amplitude of t and u, where this t for the mass of pines is minus s minus u. Okay, so this cannot have physical poles uh, by that simple argument, and uh, that means that the, our simpler amp amplitude cannot have physical poles in the t channel. So that's why we don't draw uh, poles on these uh, negative s axis. Okay. And a diagram that would contribute a state to something like this is, uh, for example, this diagram. We have our ions, or open strings in a sense, exchanging a glue string or a, or a glue ball. Um, and this diagram is what, uh, in Hadron phenomenology, 
uh, well, is uh, the example that's suppressed by this is Wright's rule, but uh, in a large n is very clear that since this diagram is non planar, it will be uh, suppressed by powers of 1 over n. <laughs> so uh, these sort of diagrams disappear, and we no longer have counter physical poles on this, on this channel. Okay. So this is the analytic structure of, of the amplitude, and now we can start playing the, the usual games of writing that dispersion relations, and by assuming unitarity and so on, obtain that. Okay. So uh, in a second, I'll, I'll describe the EFT for pines. But before doing that, I want to point out how this is very similar to the um, conformal bootstrap story, um, perhaps a little more than we at first recognized. So. Um, what I'm going to do now, just for this argument, is I'm going to assume a spin zero Rigid behavior, and later I'll do that better. Uh, so I, I, won't exp I do not expect you to believe that the amplitude uh, satisfies this, but for the sake of the discussion, let me assume that a fixed negative u is going to fit in the complex plane. This amplitude is sufficiently bounded. Okay. Later I'll correct this, but uh, for now this is correct. Now. I can write down an unsubtracted dispersion relation where I have the contour around infinity um, of ds prime and ds prime u plus prime minus s, and this has to be zero. Okay, because we're around infinity. So now I have an extra fold somewhere here, this s, I have a contour around infinity, and I can shrink it down to pick up the contribution from here and the contribution from every fold. So basically, if you rearrange this, you see that um, this proves convergence of this representation for this amplitude. You can write it as a sum over masses and spins of some uh, unshell three-point couplings times a gigant power function, uh, the cosine of m squared minus k. So this, this looks like the nothing, like it's like the usual uh, partial wave, but it says a little more because it, it tells me that I can write the full amplitude just as a sum over poles on the on the x channel, and that the only data that I need to define this um, four point uh, amplitude, uh, if this inverted behavior is correct, are the unshell couplings, the masses, and the spin. Okay, so this is uh, very analogous uh, to what we have in the usual um, OP story for the conformal bootstrap uh, to the OP coefficients, the scaling dimensions. And the spin. Okay. But we can bring this uh, even farther by using crossing symmetry and subtracting one minus the other. And I, 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 we obtain a bootstrap equation that looks like time square j of the coupling square of pj. I'll write the cosine so p u over s over m square minus s minus pj of one plus two i's over u over m squared minus u, and this has to be equal to zero. Okay? And unitarity is the statement that this has to be uh, non -negative. So I, I want to convince you that this looks very much like a conformal, uh, like a bootstrap equation. And now what we can do is to start in, in the, well, following the, the numerical conformal bootstrap, we can start taking derivatives with respect to s and u, and evaluate them at s and u equals to zero. And what you find in this way is not zero. Um, well, zero is um, what um, it could be anywhere else. And in fact, um, now we're thinking that um, this behavior can actually be correct at smaller s. So it would, it would be interesting to do another thing. But usually we're used to the forward limit. If you do it around zero, what you obtain are exactly the null constraints that we're used to obtaining via EFTs. No, but it just looks like u equals to zero is a weird point because you have this. Ratios u over s, s over u. So. Right, yeah, yeah well, but uh, um, this you can replace by, by m squared actually, because it's in, in front of a, of a pole, and, and these masses are uh, positive. So you can do this for our limit. I would, I would have, 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 have about to ask what, 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 what form of cost data do you use? Because uh, on, on the pole you can replace s by m square, but now you have everything that's away from the Yeah, pole, I, so I, I think have to decide how you Yeah, there's some with the. Uh, yeah, I think, I think this is actually wrong. You should have put m square. Okay, yes, yeah, there you go. Sorry. Okay. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, exactly. And, and since these um, masses are away from zero, I can, I can expand around zero in, in this space. And what you obtain is precisely the null constraint <coughs> that we usually obtain from crossing symmetry at, at, at lower energies. Yeah, but I just wanted to, 
to, to show that this is uh, very much so. These null constraints are nothing but derivative, but derivatives of a of a bootstrap bridge. Okay, but um, right. So the problem, of course, is that this is not correct. We have to take subtractions, and in general, the regular behavior that we expect, the regular behavior that we expect, uh, is limit of s going to infinity of something zero. With two subtractions to go to zero. So this is the, the, you know, this is the two. That's what we expect in general. But in large M, we can even do better because uh, for PCD, we know uh, what this is controlled by, and that's the first, uh, the leading regit trajectory. Okay? And that's the so called Pomeran. And the Pomeran is what gives it a growth like S squared, and then it retires and it's a, a little better than this. But the Pomeran looks precisely like, some, uh, like uh, these sort of diagrams. Because it's a global, uh, it corresponds to a trajectory of global states. So large n, the Pomeran is not there, and therefore um, what controls the regit growth is not this uh, regit trajectory, but the next one. And the next one is the trajectory of the romance. So the romance, remember, is the, the first mesonism has in one, and the first resonance that we find here. Okay. So that means that the growth will be uh, it will grow linear with s uh, by the by the row regit trajectory. But since it's not alone, it has more more um, contributions. It will regize what we will assume at large n is that this will uh, be strictly better than one. Okay? So the claim is that at large n, you can make this better um, uh, assumption about, uh, about the rate to be taken. So it means that I can write down um, these perfect relations with one subtraction. Uh, and, sir, uh, can yes. these, so, so these, these statements, how rigorous are they? I mean, what is, uh, okay, so um, they are mostly motivated by, by uh, ex uh, experiments, so observation, and, and these regit trajectories have been observed, and, uh, and the intercept of the, the raw regit trajectory is about like 0 0.5, so it's well below 1, and that's like the, the, main, uh, the, the, main, the main argument in motivation groups. Uh, but, 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 I mean, uh, it, it, there seems to be some, some, some gaps since you are making a statement about S goes infinity in any complex direction. So, uh, <laughs> then how do you connect this to? Right, but isn't this? Um, right, I see what you mean. Um, well, I mean, also, I guess from string theory is another, like, is an example that, that satisfies it, that also um, modifies this assumption. But in the end, I mean, we, we, we usually make the same sort of argument, right, for other other regular I don't know, like to, to a certain extent it, it is an assumption. So, uh, yeah. I, I mean, there are some uh, non perturbative uh, statement about this can be proven quantum from some axioms. Uh, but, uh, uh, but here, uh, you, uh, you're taking, you know, the large n limit and you're stripping off the, you know. Uh, so, uh, it, it's, not, uh, it's not a statement about the, num you know, the, the full amplitude. I'm just wondering, you know, whether some of this can be uh, rigorously proven from some uh, uh, you know, basic assumptions. Or right. Yeah, I, I don't know if. Uh... I don't think so. I mean, we don't know. We don't. Nobody has formulated the Omnis theory in any number of ways. Yeah, I think only statement that's on the other just sort of long is the m over s squared. Yeah, that one has been proven. Yes. The 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 square. But s one is not a good assumption. Yeah, and it's it's proven when there is a gap. In this case, we sort of have a gap because the first the first resonance has. Well, we don't have a gap because it might find some. No, no, yeah, but I mean, I mean, in, in the intermediate states, the finds cannot not appear. So, yeah. in that sense, there there is this. Yeah. yeah. So okay, um, right. So what happens when you have uh, when you need subtractions? That this um, story is not so clean. You need to add some jump here, accounting for that subtraction, and that effectively uh, amounts to. But you also need some unshelled uh, four-point diagrams in this um, data that you need to define this amplitude. Okay. But, but still, the statement uh, holds that um, null constraints are nothing but derivatives of this sort of um, <coughs> equation. So um, now what, uh, what I'll do is to describe, um, to, to retreat to low energies, and I'll discuss um, the, the effectical theory for pi. Okay, and then we'll put bounds in the low energy uh, EFT couplings, because that already gives you uh, information about, about the full theory. Sorry, uh, I, I have a question. So you assume larger in the expansion at all energies, right? Mm -hmm. So when you say S goes to infinity, it's uh, it's much larger than N, or it's... Uh, no, no, N is the first thing I send to infinity, and then I work everything with... So N is the largest scale that there, there is. 
full scale. So it's the largest number that there is. And then everything is, is without assumption. Uh, take that. Yeah, so so all these uh, all these poles here will have a residue that's proportional to one over n all the way to infinity. That's, 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 the, the assumption will work. Uh, and, and that's that's also like what you expect for uh, for string theory. I mean, the like API is, is that they converge if you sum all of them and that doesn't give you any enhanced behavior. Right. Um, because there is an infinite number of them. Hmm. And the range of behavior assumption just proved to be right. Oh, that's true. So, okay. Um, right, the, the EFT for pines is the usual chiral Lagrangian. That uh, it just uses the fact that these pines are, are Golston bosons. So we write uh, this matrix U, A to the I, um, 1 over F pi, here pi m times sigma. And this belongs to SU2. And then we write down all the terms that are compatible with the, with the symmetries of the problem, expanding in the number of derivatives. So u, d, u, d, u, u. And then these coefficients here that I'm writing are unfixed by the symmetries. And these are the coefficients we're going to put bounds on. And so on. Yeah. So um, again, I, I have an expan expansion in the number of derivatives with these couplings, the low energy couplings that are unfixed by the symmetries. And now this this um, Lagrangian can only be used up to um, some cutoff. Here, some energy m squared, and sometimes it is a little controversial what the cutoff should be in some settings. But here, there is no, uh, there should be no discussion because you can push this cutoff obviously uh, only up to the first resonance. So this uh, cutoff should be identified with the mass of the of the row. Okay. So here it's very clear what what the, the cutoff is. And instead of um, writing everything in terms of the Lagrangian, it's more efficient to to parameterize your couplings at the level of the amplitude. And the amplitude for this just looks like the sum of so low energies. This amplitude just looks like a sum of four point contact diagrams expanded in the number of derivatives. So um, this just corresponds to Taylor expansion where I have some Wilson coefficients that's uh, the ones that we will put down. G1, G2. And so okay, so this G1 is effectively a pi decay constant, and the G2 and G2 prime are in one to one correspondence with uh, these other coefficients, L1 and L2. Okay. And um, now what we do is write down uh, one subtractive dispersion relation, and that's the usual argument. So Vs prime and prime u of enough subtractions has to be zero, and enough subtractions here means um, starting with k equals one, two, three, and so on. We have a, a, a whole tower of dispersion relations you can write. And there's a subtlety that there's actually two independent uh, sets of uh, dispersion relations, one at fixed u, so fixed u smaller than zero, and another at fixed t smaller than zero. And the reason is that this discussion should really have been for the full amplitude, so the script A, B, C, D, that remember was written in terms of the different cross versions of the simpler amplitude. So if you translate the, the, the spin one version behavior for this to that one, you get that in these two limits, it should, it should, uh, you should be able to write down these dispersion relations. So this is just a means that uh, we'll have more null constraints coming from these two uh, different, different sets. Okay. So now um, I won't review the argument, but the idea is as, as usual that um, we have here the subtractions, and in, at this pole here I can use the EFT, and I shrink down the contour, and on this left, high, left hand side I pick um, the coefficients that I'm interested in, and on the right hand side I just use a partial wave expansion, and the only thing I assume is unitarity. And unitarity, so here I'll, I'll go around all the poles, and unitarity is the statement that the the 
factorial density less has to be greater or equal than zero. And in general, we also have an upper bound here, smaller or equal than two. Okay. So the one that we will use is only this right hand side, and in the larger limit, that's the best you can do. Because this row really is a sum of delta functions. So this thing involves delta functions that have the Anschluss coupling squared times um, s minus m of the location of the poles. And these Anschluss couplings are proportional to 1 over m. Okay. So uh, these coefficients are really tiny in the large and limit, and there is no meaning to these upper bounds. Okay. So that's uh, effectively what I'm saying is that the theory by this assumption, we're saying that it's very weakly coupled, and then the only uh, meaningful bound is, is the positive. If phi, so m rho, we can choose the scale, and if phi is it positive, what is it in terms of m rho? Um, you mean in nature, or? Not in nature, in your theory. Okay. So. It's the 1 over n scaling. Um, oh, 1 over n scaling, I, okay. okay. So f phi is uh, proportional to n. Yeah, so all these are proportional to n. F phi, f phi square is proportional to n. All these uh, couplings are, are proportional to n. And the mass of the row is, is a constant. Uh, but the phi is proportional to, L, to m? Oh, uh, to, no, no. Oh, to m. To n, yeah. Okay. Phi is proportional to square root of n. Is that what you were asking for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. And then all these couplings, um, L1 and L2, are proportional to n. So the counting here works. And really what we will put bounds on are ratios of these, such that the n dependence disappears. Okay. So the bounds that we will obtain will be on quantities, let me write them here. Uh, these normalized ratios that are g tilde 2, that's g2 over g1 m squared. Okay, so this is a dimensionless, dimensionless ratio. And here, uh, this g2 is the uh, fourth order uh, fourth coefficient, and g1 is basically the f by the k constant. Okay, so here the, the n dependence drops. Not g1 squared? Um, no, it's g1. G1 already contains f5 squared. Yeah, I mean, it's by definition, right? I mean, this G1 actually, is, yeah, it's, 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 this is the correct one. And yeah, I also have the prime, it's the same thing. Okay, um, and so it's the usual story from um, uh, this expression of relations, I link low energies to high energies, and I can write down some rules that look like some GI equals some average of some function, depends on the masses and spins, and some null constraints that are the same thing, some other functions of the masses and spins that have to uh, equate to zero. Okay? And these null constraints, again, are just uh, equivalent to the derivatives of the, of the bootstrap equation. So the more I have, it's like increasing the lambda of the conformal bootstrap. And then you can just uh, throw these, well, well these, these averages are just sums over masses and spins with uh, positive measure, measure here. Okay? And yeah, in any case, you can throw these equations into these functions into SPV and start uh, carving out the space uh, of allowed values for these these couplings. Okay. So now, if we can get the, the <coughs> screen now, um, I'll, I'll show you some plots of. Uh, of the, uh, Contour, you are not going to use the form of n that you wrote before in terms of the couplings and the, and the poles? Um, no, what I use is a. Uh, okay, so, so that came from um, um, a partial wave expansion. So what I use here is just a partial wave expansion. Um, but it, it really is a sum of, over delta functions, but since I don't know the positions of this, I, I just treat this as a, as a continuum. So I'm going, to, um, it's just a spectral density times some gigabyte. So in the end, it does look like a gigabyte, but that, that thing, I, so um, that representation, I derive by, by writing this uh, contour integral. So I effectively use the same thing, but uh, that was a consequence. It was not. A thing. And for the second equation, are you also going to use? I forgot what the second equation. Is. The, the one with the zero. The oh, the non zero. Yeah, both, both from the same. Okay. So I first obtained the, the first set. So um, some function g i equals the average of some function of the masses and spins. And then uh, what happens is that you will see that uh, sometimes you obtain uh, different things, like di two different functions that have to average to the same coupling. And then, so this is because of crossing symmetry at low energies. That the, we had uh, this g, g1 came with 
as um, a u. So because this crossing symmetry in low energies, you will find that sometimes two different functions have to equate to the same thing. So the subtraction is what I was calling x, i, and that's what has to average to z. That's the logic. Uh, okay. And that, is that equation where you put like derivatives in u and s, that, that's going to separate them? Uh, yeah, that's, that was another way to obtain this uh, that didn't need to, uh, to go through the EFT argument. So usually we obtain them in this way. Uh, but but uh, what I just wanted to emphasize that this thing really just means crossing symmetry, and you, in order to derive these null constraints, you don't need to go through it. It's useful, but it's, it's not necessary. But now the bounds that I'm going to put, these things are intrinsically uh, EFT coupling because these are literally the couplings in the chiral Lagrange. Wait, and M is going to be what? M? Oh, M is uh, is just the mass of the rows. So you can replace M for uh, the mass of the row mass. Uh, because, um, so remember, so this M is some cutoff where you, you use the EFT below this cutoff, and then uh, you need uh, partial wave expansion beyond that. And this cutoff can be pushed only up to the first resonance, so the best bounds come if you plug uh, N equals M rho. So the, the cutoff is basically the amount of the rho. So this is what, what we obtain. And what I'm plotting here is the, the allowed values for G2 versus G2 prime, and this normalized ratio, the tilde. And in color, we have the allowed region, and outside is the disallowed region. Okay? And the different colors correspond to these different ends. That's basically roughly the number of null constraints. It's the, the power of the, 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 the derivative order that I'm uh, stopping at. And by this time, well, so this curve has visually converged, we were using about 110 null constraints or something like that. Okay? And you see that the plot converges, and surprisingly, there is a sharp kink here. Uh, that raises the question whether this can be a large MPCB or not. So of course, uh, remember, uh, what we have here is the, the uh, allowed space. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> 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 sorry. <laughs> if you don't see the rest, it's, it's just another chart. Okay, so, um, yeah. <laughs> so, so the, um, remember, so large N uh, theories and the uh, that satisfy a crossing symmetry unitary, uh, uh, unitarity and spin one ratio behavior must live here, their EFTs, and one of such theory is going to be large MPCP. So in, the, in this bootstrap spirit of ours, we ask whether it can be the special point or not. But of course, it, it could be anywhere on, on, the, on the Okay, so, um, right. Can I help with? Uh, use the down on top of oh, okay. yeah. Okay. So um, what we could do in order to answer this question, or at least understand a little better what we have, is to compare it to known data. Okay? And the analog of um, the Monte Carlo simulations for the easing model, <coughs> in this case, would be lattice QCD. So we would love to have these values computed for a so large N QCD in the lattice, but unfortunately we're told that these are very um, difficult to compute or very expensive, and they are more interested in uh, n equals to 3 and massive quartz rather than the large n limit. So this, the, as far as we know, this, uh, these values have not been computed, and we cannot compare to actual data for large MQCD. So the best we can currently do is to compare to actual experiment, and this is what we get. <laughs> so these four points are determinations of these values in, in the literature, or the real world, from experiment, and they're all over the place. <laughs> So uh, we cannot draw uh, many conclusions, but it's, I think it's remarkable that they overlap at all. Because remember, this plot is for large n theories, and this is for n equals to three and massive uh, pi n, so massive quarks. Whereas our, we are in the in the kind of limit. Okay, um, and also I, I mean it's surprising that uh, from very few assumptions we have narrowed the area down to something that is comparable to the experimental uncertainty. So perhaps if you're hopeful enough, um, optimistic enough, there's this is the way to go. In any case, um, so another thing we can we did was to compare to um, known the well known theories some models. So remember, this general dimension is the most general thing to write down. But then you can start making choices for these couplings to for to get some specific models. And there's some that have been used in the literature. And there is one particular uh, one that has been used very extensively. That's the Skirm model. So Skirm model is basically the choice that L2 equals minus L1 equals to some tunable parameter um, e squared, e squared. Okay. And this cho choice is such that these ter two terms combine into something that can be written in, uh, in terms of uh, some, uh, some commutators. And it's such that uh, these terms that are for order 4 in derivatives are only at most order 2 in time derivatives. 
And this uh, is something that they use this model to describe variance as solitons for this uh, chiral Lagrange. But in any case, we can just plug these, uh, these values and compare it to our result. And surprisingly, it sits exactly on this line. So this line is, is, a, is a sharp line. This is this lower bound here. Is, a, is this uh, sharp <coughs> line with uh, so the ratio of these two is four. And uh, the square model happens to sit exactly there. Okay, so this means that the square model uh, does, uh, so it satisfies unitarity, it leads up to the king, and it saturates uh, the, the bound. And that's something that we did not know. And then it saturates it, so it's only valid, valid up to this point, and you can translate this into a bound for this, for this couple. So that's something that we also did not know, that uh, for unitarity you, uh, you have a lower bound on this, on this uh, parameter. Okay, so unless there are any questions, I'll uh, yeah, get yeah, the rest yeah, of the yeah. questions. So from this identification, this curve model, you know the position of the, the red dot? Um, well, so the, the red dot I know numerically, and then I can translate that into a bound for this, this guy here. So, so the square model is for any e, and this e just moves you through this line all the way to infinity. That's the square model. The square model doesn't give you the full amplitude or just the satisfaction of the coupling? Um, no, no, of course not. It's just an EFT. So it's ah, a, just an EFT. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's one particular choice of an EFT, yes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, knowing this, uh, it's surprising, but it's, it doesn't solve the theory or, or tell you where the square model comes from. Yeah, uh, so to, to get those bounds, you, I think, you, you're, uh, you're trying to find a functional so that it's positive at, uh, for, for every part for all um, mass higher than capital M or, or one of the wrong masses, right? Yes, exactly. But, I mean, is it too strong? I mean, it's not necessary to require positivity in between two. Mm -hmm. that, that's a fair point. Yeah, we, we would love to to enforce that these poles are isolated, but we don't know how to do it so far. So we've, uh, I mean, a way to do it would be like to assume that here, that, well, to enforce that there has to be some zero between pole and pole or something. That's something that we haven't managed to do. And so far we assume positivity everywhere from the cutoff to infinity. And indeed we would love to do it. But it's the same in the conformal boost of the spectrum is discrete, but... Exactly, yes. Um, uh, yes? Um, okay, I, uh, first of all, uh, you know, I was just commenting, I mean, with the full bootstrap, you can put a gap and then start operating. So, like, it is a way of enforcing discrete values, oh. at least within some region. Yeah, we'll do that just in a second. Yeah. I, okay, yeah. I mean, the other thing I was going to ask is, I remember from one of your previous slides, it seems like the, the bound is very little changing below the red dot. So, it's like, even for, like, the, the n equals 2 case, it seems the same as n equals 15. So, like, is it changing at all? Like, is this just by i it doesn't seem to be changing? Uh, it, it, it is changing, yeah, it, it actually converges, so it converges quite fast here, so for, okay, so for n equals 2, the bound is up here, the king, for n equals to 3 is like here. No, 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 I, I'm, I'm saying to the, left, to the left of the dot, to the left of the dot where it seems like things aren't changing. So, oh, yeah, yeah, this, are they changing thing, at all, or is it just analytically the same for n equals 2 all the way up to n equals 2? Um, so that straight line, like, like... Yeah, yeah, so this part here, no, they're not changing at all, I mean, the, so, okay. Um, the, depending on your precision, you can get closer and closer to these four. So it's a, it's a, a ratio where, uh, well, it, it's a, a one fourth or so. And so with, with this null constraint, you can solve, where you only have one null constraint, you can solve this analytically, and you see that this whole line here corresponds to this one fourth. And then when you do it for higher and higher null constraints, this does not change in this part, and you always get closer and closer as you improve uh, um, the, the, um, the precision to, to this one over four. So this does not does not change at all. What changes is up here. So you're saying all the constraints are somehow redundant below this? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not sure they're redundant. It's just that I think I see this as a, as a first order phase transition, where um, it, there's like a maximization, and it's, it's more efficient for it to um, satisfy the, the constraint that comes from here than, than the, the, so, so there's the, there's like a battle between one and another, and here it always wins the, the simplest one. And the, the extra ones are, are constraints on the spectrum, so not any spectrum poles, but, but the bound remains the same. Can you put bounds on F pi over M rho? Um, that would be just U1, n not with this method that, that I know of. You would need... Um, uh, that's N dependent, so yeah. the answer is not. Oh, that's a good question. Well, that's okay. that. Okay. Well, what's N? So so far the best 
I, I don't see a way of not normalizing by f5. So like uh, the bounds we can get is if things normalize by f5. I, I don't. I'm not aware of a way. I mean, you are putting in the mass somehow. Oh yeah, the mass is for for dimensional uh, reasons. In the but that's essentially the mass of the raw metal, right? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, but but what you're saying is uh, not half this, right? And uh, So, um, yes. Anything else? So, what I wanted to discuss now is the. So, all this was for the Cairo Lagrangian, that's just an EFT of the pi ends. And what we can do next, as I was suggesting, uh, add gaps. And the thing we'll do is to. Let me explain this thing. What we'll do is use an EFT. That includes the, the row pole. So we have the row pole and then the other meson. So now we'll put another cutoff here, m prime squared, that should be thought of as the, the next mass on the spectrum, that's the mass of the F2 meson. That's also, also not. Okay, so now at low energies, um, the sort of diagrams that contribute are the explicit pole of the row. And then uh, the two channels in a row, and then um, an analytic piece that accounts for having integrated out all the other resins in the spectrum. Okay, and what this um, gives you. Okay, so if I were to integrate this out, I would, I would go back to the Cairo Lagrangian that I had before. But now this gives you control uh, uh, on the on-shell couplet, so G pi pi rho. And now what we can do is also put bands on this and this couple here. Now the first thing I'll do is to integrate this out and assume, assume just positivity here. So effectively, effectively what I'll be doing is enforce that there is this uh, spin one um, operator, so stay here, and then I continue above this new cutoff, and I'll show how, uh, how this plot changes when you do that. And then later I'll show you the band on, on this couple here uh, on its own. Okay. So first this one, and here we're zooming in onto the theories that have a larger and larger gap above the row. So I'm asking inside this plot, where are the theories that have a row as a first exchange state, and then everything uh, else after, uh, after this gap, m prime. And I start when there is no gap, and I have recovered the same plot as before, and then I start increasing this gap, and you see that it, it <coughs> zooms in onto this lower part here. So yeah. the gap on all spin channels? Uh, yes, every, every, so spin 0, 1, 2, 3, so uh, start. Yes. Then this line, the reason that the bomb is not changing, that the solution only contains one state. That's exactly right. Yeah. And so this suggests that the, at, at very large, uh, when the gap is very large, what you have is just a spin one particle, and then everything pushed to infinity. That's like a funny completion of the U, of the a funny UV completion of the row, and it's sort of like uh, evidence that this might not be actually physically. It's just a funny solution to cross it. Yeah. I'll discuss that uh, in a second. But uh, yeah, if you're interested in to know this value for, for actual like the real world, it's about like 1.6. So we would we would be somewhere between the orange and the green line, and that's where QCD should actually sit, and it's surprisingly closer to where the point where. But in any case, we can keep going, and uh, as, as we uh, as I just said, um, we, we see that this line, this term line, survives all the way to 20. Okay. So this is one thing uh, that we can do with this more refined amplitude, and the other thing that I promised you was this band, an upper band, on the row coupling. So this is again a normalized ratio. So I have uh, g, um, this g rho squared is um, g pi pi rho squared. And I have to normalize also by, by g pi, uh, by the pi squared, so to one, and then the mass of the row squared. Okay. And I do this as a function of this gap above the row. And I start from, well, there's a smooth curve. And when it's very large, it reaches a plateau. So we see some other features. The question is, what do these correspond to? And we got quite <laughs> well, uh, a little excited when it started because it looked like it was converging to this uh, line here, this one half uh, line. That is something that's known in the um, Hadron phenomenology community as a <coughs> relationship derived long ago. But uh, actually, when you run a fit to see like where this is going to converge, this part has converged. This part has not converged yet. And when you run a fit from the ones I'm not showing you, 
to a very large number of non constraints is that it, it's clear that it will converge somewhere below this line. But in any case, uh, we can compare to experimental electricity again, and it's inside our, our uh, bounds, but uh, rather far from one of the lines. Okay. So, right, and yeah, and to conclude, I just want to discuss uh, what I said that this. Uh, that some funny solutions to crossing might actually separate the band, separate the band. And this is something this analytic ruling in, uh, something that was started by, by Simone and Vincent in their original paper, where uh, it's just observing that some, so okay, so we obtain these bands by assuming almost nothing, and it's great because we go a great uh, way without assuming uh, much, but that also means that simple solutions to crossing might be allowed by, by the simple assumptions you make. And it turns out that some of them separate the bands. For instance, we have uh, spin zero exchange, it's, uh, it's that output there, and it's um, crossing symmetric, uh, unitary, and spin one regular bounded. So if you plot this at low energies, it, it defines as a function of this mass, uh, it, it uh, covers this line here, and it sort of explains this down that corner, in a sense. And the same for this other point in theory, that's a product of S and U fold, and this is, uh, again, healthy by our uh, assumptions, and if you, uh, you subtract the spin zero contribution. So if you plot this, it lives on this line, and it explains this uh, top right corner. So the question is whether these two lines here, including the, the king, might, might also be explained by, by some funny solutions to crossing. Yeah. And we already saw some hints that this might actually be the case. Um, so let me summarize that. And we saw that um, by imposing larger and larger gaps, we saw that it was converging on, this, uh, lower, on the lower line. So that suggests that this uh, line here below the king might be explained by a simple theory the spectrum is just a p one particle, so the wrong, and then everything else is pushed to infinity. And then we tried, and we found some, so a theory that satisfies this, uh, that, that, that has the spectrum and satisfies the assumptions, and it does rule in part of the line, I'll show you in a second, but only up to some part. So we haven't quite managed to, to reach the king, that's something that we still do not understand. But uh, what we have also done is to play some um, other numerical experiments with GAP to try to understand this upper part here. And we have some evidence that suggests that this bound can also be explained by a simple uh, theory that has the same thing, so a row and everything else to infinity, but at an intermediate scale, it has a, a funny theory that looks like that product. So we have m4 uh, over m squared minus s, m squared minus u, and then we subtract the spin zero contribution and the spin one contribution. So this we obtain again by, by playing with different gaps, writing this spectrum, and checking whether the bound remained or not. Okay. And uh, then with this, uh, with this knowledge, we tried our best to find a, um, an analytic amplitude like those two that, that separates the bounds. And the best we could do is this. So I won't go through the details, but it's just the, the theory that uh, lived here at the top. And we subtract literally spin 0 and spin 1 with the coefficients. That, so, okay, so subtract spin 0 subtract spin 1, and then add spin 1 at the mass of the row, so a lower mass. And then playing with these masses, you can cover a uh, whole region, and you need this, the coefficient such that this amplitude is unitary. And you can, you can do that. Uh, however, uh, it covers this line. So it does cover part of the sliver, so it rules in uh, a farther part, and as I was saying, it separates this bound up to some, some dot here, but it doesn't quite reach the bound, and there's still this part here that's not ruled in. So this might be, um, well, yeah, and it's not a matter of convergence, because if you look at the other plot, it's clear that our a simple theory does not quite reproduce this structure. Oh, yes? So in the bootstrap, when you have kinks, sometimes you can see why a kink occurs by looking at the spectrum and seeing, say, like, not greater spheres. Is there some analog in the story? You can see yeah, I'll show you. It's my next slide. I'll show you the spectrum that we have. Yeah, that's something that also puzzles us very much. So for, here is just playing with gaps and trying to, like, make some, some guesswork, but the other approach would be to ask us if you and we're confused by, by the results. Yeah, so the only thing I wanted to say before moving on is that um, and this might be, um, well, due to a lack of uh, like imagination on our part, that we just needed to like tune some coefficients or something to actually get there. So somebody might, might find this, this amplitude. Uh, but it could be also that there's some structure that we fail to see. Like something. What's, more. what's this for? MHS? Oh, it's just some, uh, it means higher spin. So this is a tower of higher spin, so it's two masses. There is, uh, you, you can play with two parameters, the mass of the row and this mass of higher spin. It's just another made very large. So it is this point here. And then when you start up here, they are both on the same position, because that's not the theory that you have. And then when you're down here, in principle, what should happen is that 
uh, you just send it to infinity to recover the other one. And then in between, you're just, uh, it's the ratio between, you're tuning between the two to move along this line. That's because you were that showing that below the dots, you could push this gap seemingly arbitrarily. Exactly, high. yes. So, so yeah, you're not showing the UV completion, right? You're only showing. There's yeah, I mean, I, ha I haven't written it down here. Uh -huh. no, I, I can write it down. Why is this not UV completion? Sorry. You mean this thing one UV completion? Yeah, uh, I mean, that, that MUV is. is this <coughs> MUV. Uh, yeah, MUV. So, okay. Let me be more precise. Sorry. Uh, MUV is just. Um, so, the spin 1 million Bauer, that is. Uh, I'm not going right 1 plus 2 U m squared over m squared minus s times something that I'll show you in a second. And 1 plus 2 s over m squared m squared minus u. So this would be the spin 1 amplitude. And the problem, of course, is that it grows linearly with s. So you have to correct that, because otherwise it does not satisfy the, the regular behavior. So what you do is the simplest thing you could do. You multiply it by a pole at some mass that we send, it's very large, we send to infinity, of u and 1 over m squared minus s. Infinity. So this thing is some scale that you should think is very large. And uh, the larger you take it, it's closer to, to, to the spin 1 amplitude. But um, if you go at higher and higher energies, these dams this dam, the, the grow with that. So this is an unit. It's what you hide it here. And this is the one that only rolls in up to this point for whatever reason that we don't quite. Yeah. So yeah, and now going back to Shai's question, um, we, we also look for the zeros of the functional. That's how you get in the conformable surface, as far as I know, the numerical one, the, the spectrum. And we are very, very puzzled by, by the results. So this is some gener generic point above the king, some generic point below the king. That's a spectrum that, so I take the functional that separates that, that bound, and I plot the zeros. And um, at first you might say, well, there's some rigid trajectories here, that's, that's what you might look for, might be looking for. But they are actually on the wrong side of the spectrum, the, the, the uh, wrong side of the plot compared to what we expect. And the puzzle, of course, is that this looks nothing like this simple spectrum that, that we had guessed from by playing, by, by playing with gaps. And one possibility could be that some of these poles uh, shouldn't be there, and that it's just um, so that you should remove them, for instance, by studying their OP coefficients. But we've, we've tried that. And then for some cases, it appears to match our guesses. But uh, for others, even if you remove some, some points, it doesn't quite um, explain that. So another possibility uh, could be that uh, this is that there is some degener degeneracy or some approximate degeneracy of different theories that separate the bound. So in that sense, after all, what we are exploring is the FT. So we are expanding around zero and then looking at two-dimensional plot. So I think there's room for some degeneracies. And for some reason, as the BB speaking, one solution, and we were looking at some other solutions. It could be that more than one theory uh, separates that, that bound. But this is still something that, that we don't quite know. And just to conclude, I want to, so this is my last slide, last slide. I want to um, say that this is, of course, uh, we did the simplest thing you could do. We considered the scattering only of mesons and the lowest uh, of, of them due to the scattering of, of pions. And we like to, well, what we see here, um, well, we like to see this as, as an example of a whole uh, program of uh, studying theories at large end, because this is a perfect play, playground for all these methods. So now we could start trying to impose a new constraints to kill these like, funny theories or things like that and try to, to get uh, deeper into this plot. And one thing we could do, uh, an analogy again with the conformal bootstrap, or then that we are actually doing, is to consider mixed correlator bootstrap, where instead of just scattering um, ions, we also consider a scattering of external rows, then we consider a mixed, a mixed uh, cor correlator problem and see if that gives us further constraints and maybe shrinks everything to an atom. Like, who knows? And one other thing one could do would be to move, for instance, to the global uh, sector and study the scattering of globals and so on. There's, there's a lot of possibilities. And with that, I'll conclude. Thank you. Yes? So, so I guess when your motivation of like large n is one of the gaps to simplest case, is there any simplicity you would gain by adding super symmetry? Uh, so one thing I think you, you would gain is uh, better regular behavior, and that's that's uh, that gives you more null constraints. So perhaps yeah, that that like it's, it's a very uh, like it's a it's a nice thing you could do. I guess and I'm not I'm not really sure like what else you gain with super symmetry, but um, that's really definitely something that. Uh, yeah. So you 
you, you came at the beginning at the derivation of our constraints in terms of conformal bootstrap, and there it looks like you could have said that you set the derivative where you want it, like you always the derivative where you want it. So uh, why not do that and uh, keep the imaginary part of the way to zero of the derivative somewhere else? Possible. Yes, that's something that we uh, are thinking of trying. We, we haven't quite done it systematically, and I, I asked Simon whether it's possible <laughs> or not. And in principle, it might be hard to get positivity uh, out of it if you expand around somewhere else. But it, it, uh, it's certainly, in principle, it's, it's certainly possible to expand somewhere else. <coughs> and actually, it's something that you might want to do because around zero, remember, we, we have at most has been more erratic behavior or even worse than two. But uh, if you keep going at a smaller, a negative, a smaller negative view, um, in principle, since the rigid trajectory uh, goes down, you can you can assume better uh, rigid behavior at those lower lower views. So this is something very desirable you would like to do to expand a uh, smaller view, but we haven't done it systematically. So it's positivity is not a problem. I mean, that expansion you knew is that the positive is factor density. The problem would be you saying maybe if you plug this in SDP. Yeah, finding functionals functions that are positive. Yeah, that might be a SDP. There was this condition that today is not that and that is called asymptotic positivity. Right. So that, that dictates in the conformal booster, for example, the choice of the point that equals the part of one cup. That's very important. Right. But for you, what is the asymptotic positivity? I, Does it select for you some points for which you have a synthetic I, I honestly don't know. So for, for now we know it works. So for this case where you have no massless pole, it works around zero. And that's we haven't really explored like anything beyond that. So I don't know. I mean it might be that, that this is the choice you're you're left to by, by this is synthetic positivity, but we, we haven't really done to check. But no. do you know if you have a synthetic positivity for it? I, I don't know. No. Well what do you mean by synthetic positivity? Okay, so yeah, well, what we have done is to check that our functionals uh, continue to be positive, so that we have checked, but numerically. So we, I don't have like any a definite proof that, that those functionals are always positive. Okay. Yes. Uh, <coughs> how, how feasible is it to analyze the five-point amplitude? <laughs> <laughs> well, we like to think that, that it can be obtained from the, like, the, the other, like the, unsh the three uh, unshell coupling and so on. But uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what crossing is uh, for, for five-point amplitudes. And, uh, I, I honestly don't know how to do it. The reason I ask you is because for five points, you, at least for more than two flavors, you have the additional input of the Wasserwind of turn. That's a good point, yes. But you also get it, uh, you also see it from sources. So if you add sources to the game, like yeah. photons and so, you can also uh, try to like look into that without having to go to, to for uh, like five, five times. But yes, yes, that's, uh, that'd be nice. Is there some general principle that would allow you to say that the mass of the lightest resonance have to be has to grow with J? You know, so you, you have this is the analog of the unitarity bound. Yes. Uh, piece, but here you don't have the analog of the unitarity bound. So what you can do is like a minimal rigid trajectory and allow the force that everything is beyond that. And this would be nice because it would uh, enforce that you cannot have infinite towers of, of um, like, yeah, even spin infinite towers of, yeah, whatever. whatever yeah. So what I was trying to say is that, yes, that's something that would be nice to have, and we've tried to make this plot by imposing, like, um, uh, so, so tilting this line with a, with a uh, minimal register slope and start, like, increasing that. But I don't, I don't think there is a general principle, or I'm not aware of it, to know which one is the one that you should take. Like, you can span it, uh, but uh, you cannot, I mean, uh, it would certainly be very nice to have something analogous to the unitarity time. Any other questions? Well, thanks, John.